Our mission is to build a detailed, realistic computer model of the human brain. And、uh, we've done in the past four years a proof of concept on a small part of the rodent brains. And with this proof of concept, we are now scaling the project up to reach the human brain. Why are we doing this? There's three important reasons. The first is it's Essential for us to understand the human brain if we do want to get along in society, and I think that it is a key step in evolution. The second reason is we cannot keep doing animal experimentation forever, and we have to embody all our data and all our knowledge into a working model. It's like a Noah's Ark. It's like an archive. And the third reason is that there are two billion people on the planet that are affected by mental disorder, and the drugs that are used today are largely empirical. And I think that we can come up with very concrete solutions how to treat disorders. When you walk up to a door and you open it, what you compulsively have to do to perceive is to make decisions. Thousands of decisions about the size of the room, the walls, the height, the objects in this room. Ninety-nine percent of what you see is not what comes in through the eyes. It is what you infer about that room. Can the brain build such a perception? Is it capable of doing it? Does it have the substance to do it? And that's what I'm going to describe to you today. So, it took the universe 11 billion years to build a brain. It had to improve it a little bit. It had to add to the frontal part so that you would have instincts because they had to cope on land. But the real big step was the neocortex. It's a new brain. You needed it. The mammals needed it because they had to cope with parenthood, social interactions, complex cognitive functions. So you can think of the neocortex actually as the ultimate solution today of the universe as we know it. It's the pinnacle. It's the final product that the universe has produced. It was so successful in evolution that from mouse to man, it expanded about a thousandfold in terms of the numbers of neurons to produce this almost frightening organ structure. And it has not stopped its evolutionary path. In fact, the human neocortex and the human brain is evolving at an enormous speed. If you zoom in onto the surface of the neocortex, you discover that it's made up of little modules, G5 processors, like in a computer. But there's about a million of them. They were so successful in evolution that what we did was to duplicate them over and over and add more and more of them to the brain until we ran out of space in the skull, and the brain started to fold in on itself. And that's why the neocortex is so highly convoluted. We were just packing in columns so that we'd have more neocortical columns to perform more complex functions. So what we did was, for the past 15 years, was to dissect out the neocortex systematically. It's a bit. Like going and cataloging a piece of the rainforest, how many trees does it have? What shapes are the trees? How many of each type of tree do you have? Where are they positioned? But it's a bit more than cataloging because you actually have to describe and discover all the rules of communication, the rules of connectivity. Because the neurons don't just like to connect with any neuron; they choose very carefully who they connect with. It's also more than cataloging because you actually have to build three-dimensional digital models of them, and we did that for tens of thousands of neurons. Built digital models of all the different types of neurons we came across, and once you have that, you can actually begin to build the neocortical column. And here we're calling them up, but as you do this, what you see is that the branches intersect. Actually, in millions of locations, and at each of these intersections, they can form a synapse, and the synapse is a chemical location where they can communicate with each other. And these synapses together form the network, or the circuit of the brain. So let's switch it on. But to do it, what you have to do is you have to make this come alive. We make it come alive with equations, a lot of mathematics. And in fact, the equations that make neurons into electrical generators were discovered by two Cambridge Nobel laureates, 
So we have the mathematics to make neurons come alive. We also have the mathematics to describe how neurons collect information and how they create a little lightning bolt to communicate with each other. And when they get to the synapse, what they do is they effectively, literally shock the synapse. It's like electrical shock that releases the chemicals from these synapses. And we've got the mathematics to describe this process. So we can describe the communication between the neurons. So there literally are only a handful of equations that you need to simulate the activity of the neocortex. But what you do need is a very big computer. And in fact, you need one laptop to do all the calculations just for one neuron. So you need 10,000 laptops. So where do you go? You go to IBM. And you get a supercomputer because they know how to take 10,000 laptops and put it into the size of the refrigerator. So now we have this blue gene supercomputer. We can load up all the neurons, onto each one onto its processor, and fire it up and see what happens. Take the magic carpet for a ride. Here we activate it, and this gives the first glimpse of what is happening in your brain when there's a stimulation. It's the first view. Now, when you look at that the first time, you think, my God, how is reality coming out of that? But in fact, you can start, even though we haven't trained this neocortical column to create a specific reality, but we can ask, where is the rose? We can ask, where is it inside? If we stimulate it with a picture, where is it inside the neocortex? Ultimately, it's got to be there if we stimulated it with it. So the way that we can look at that is to ignore the neurons, ignore the synapses, and look just at the raw electrical activity, because that's what it's creating. It's creating electrical patterns. So when we did this, we indeed, for the first time, saw these ghostly-like structures, electrical objects appearing within the neocortical column. And it's these electrical objects that are holding all the information about whatever stimulated it. And then when we zoomed into this, it's like a veritable universe. So the next step is just to take these brain coordinates and to project them into perceptual space. And if you do that, you would be able to step inside the reality that is created by this machine, by this piece of the brain. So, in summary, I think that the universe may have, it's possible, has evolved the brain to see itself, which may be a first step 